Nevada, a once forbidden place where people didn't go except on their way to get somewhere else, transformed itself into a place where people went to try their luck, long before Las Vegas meant anything to anyone. To see why, join me for this brief look at the history and politics of Nevada. We don't know exactly when the first inhabitants arrived in what is now Nevada. The earliest evidence of people we have comes from around 20,000 years ago, from cave-dwelling paintings such as the one in Austin, Nevada, right smack in the middle of the state. We do know that by the 16th century or so, the state had five main native groups living throughout its future territory. The Washu, Northern Paiutes, Shoshone, Southern Paiutes, and Wallapais. They were all nomadic hunter-gatherers who lived off of game, fishing, seeds, berries, and piñon nuts. They also had similar cultures and languages. With the exception of the Washu, for example, their tongues were all part of the Nomic language family, itself part of the larger Udo-Aztec speech classification. This arrangement would begin to be disturbed with the first arrival of Europeans in the region. That first person was a Spanish Franciscan missionary, Father Francisco Garces, who along with two native guides broke off at Yuma from the Dianza expedition, a trek meant to find a better overland route to California from Mexico and explore the southern part of the future state in 1776. There were other expeditions in the next few decades. One of them, led by Arturo Armijo, followed a similar route and upon entering one of the valleys named it the Meadows, or Las Vegas in Spanish. Still, finding few things of interest, the Europeans left the region mostly unexplored, even as the Spanish crown claimed the entire future state and incorporated it into one of the interior provinces of New Spain, Upper California. Those claims were transferred to an independent Mexico in 1821, but that made little difference. Instead, British and American commercial interests began routinely sending expeditions to the region in search of furs. The two most important were Jedediah Smith in 1827 and Peter Ogden in 1828, who explored the Las Vegas Valley and the Humboldt River respectively. As trappers continued to come to the region, eventually a southern overland route between California and New Mexico was established that became known as the Old Spanish Trail. The new path opened the way for American settlers on their way to California, who began to traverse it in the 1840s, but the harshness of the desert terrain pushed people to go through a more northern route established earlier, the Humboldt Trail. This didn't always end up happily for those who took the trip. The most famous of them, the Donner Party, took a wrong turn in northeastern Nevada in 1846 and ended up trapped in the Sierra Nevada where half of them died and those who survived had to resort to cannibalism. Meanwhile, Manifest Destiny made the U.S. government increasingly interested in the northern Mexican territories, so they sent John C. Fremont to the area in the mid-1840s. The result was the first and most accurate map of the region. In 1848, the Mexican-American War ended with Mexico City, Nevada, along with much of the southwest to the United States. This, coupled with the discovery of gold in California, exploded the number of people traversing Nevada and created trading posts along the northern route, which eventually became permanent settlements. The first of these was Genoa, established by Mormon pioneers in 1850. That same year, Congress began reorganizing the territory. First, with the Compromise of 1850, it divided the future state into the Utah and New Mexico territories, and later, throughout the 1860s, it created a separate territory which gained land from its neighbors in 1861, 1862, 1866, and 1868. Originally named Washu, the carve-out was also renamed Nevada after the Sierra on its eastern border, a nap name as it would become obvious later. The two big reasons for the separation from the original Utah Territory was that its Nevadan section was too far away from territorial authorities and there began to be tensions between the Mormon and non-Mormon population, which soon became a major problem given the lack of federal presence. What really changed the trajectory of the state, however, was the mining discoveries, first of gold in 1850 and later of silver in 1859. The latter, what came to be known as the Comstock Lode, was found near Virginia City and ended up becoming the largest silver strike in the history of the United States. This soon created boom towns all around the region and vastly expanded the number of people in the state. It also helped finance the Union's war effort, contributing at least $400 million to the U.S. coffers. Population growth exploded, but it was still low for statehood standards. Nonetheless, this soon became a real option because of the sudden importance the territory acquired within larger national politics. Lincoln and the Republican Party were very interested in Nevada statehood for two big reasons. The first was they needed additional votes for the two-thirds that would be necessary to amend the Constitution to abolish slavery. The second was that Lincoln thought he might need the extra votes in the Electoral College, and so its entry into the Union was expedited, and on October 31, 1864, it gained statehood. 
only the second to do so during the middle of the Civil War. In the end, its votes were not decisive for either cause, but Nevada did favor both Lincoln and the 13th Amendment. In fact, it voted for the other two Reconstruction Amendments as well, and was the first state to ratify the 15th, which was intended to allow black people to vote. Not that this made Nevada a place free of discrimination. As the state continued to be settled, its original inhabitants became foreigners in their own land as they faced legal and social discrimination, including prohibiting them from marrying whites, attending public school, and of course the loss of their traditional lands. Soon, Native Americans were exiled to reservations in the less desirable parts of the state. Few could gain an education, and thus, to the extent they interacted with white society, it was as unskilled labor. One that did manage, Sarah Winamuka, became a prominent educator and an advocate for her people. In 1883, she became the first Native American woman to publish an autobiography. Meanwhile, the state itself continued to expand. In fact, Nevada is the only state to gain so much territory after its admission to the Union. Access to water was a major concern, so Congress decided to give it land with rivers first to its east and then to its south. In the east, the state was granted an additional degree of longitude. The southern section, meanwhile, was part of the Arizona Territory until 1867, but when steamboat navigation opened up on the Colorado River up to the town of Colville, a town later submerged by the creation of the Hoover Dam, Congress decided to transfer the area to Nevada, which had no navigable river to speak of. Arizonans condemned the move, but their previous Confederate sympathies gave them little leverage, and so it was left with 18,000 fewer square miles. Meanwhile, Nevada's prosperity was tied to silver, so when the government decided to go on the gold standard in the 1870s, limiting the use of silver in the monetary system, demand for it went way down and prices began to drop. And just as one would expect, so did the fortunes of many communities around the state. Soon, ghost towns dotted the Nevada landscape. Some of them, like Beaumont, once so thriving was actually the county seat you can still visit today. Left without silver as an economic motor, the state then tried its hand at ranching in the 1880s, but profits went up and down too much, and the high transportation costs to send the cattle back east made it difficult to stay in business. Soon, there were plenty of bankrupt ranchers as well, and the state's population began to go in reverse. Silver once again came to the rescue when a new rich deposit was found in Tonopa in 1900. This, coupled with other findings of copper and gold in Eli and Goldfield respectively, plus new modern techniques that made the operations more profitable, entry into World War I, and new industrial uses for the minerals made mining a promising investment. This, in turn, brought more building of railroads and irrigation, which was used to grow hay, making cattle feed cheap and ranching profitable as well. Nevada began growing again. There was an important difference in the second boom mining period, however. Unlike the original, investments and power were not controlled by California interests or out-of-state banks. This, coupled with the reforms from the progressive era, allowed for more even distribution of the prosperity and what that actually stayed in the state. The seemingly happy arrangement, however, was appended by the Great Depression. Mining once again went bust in the state. Fortunately for Nevada, the state did not suffer as much as other states during this period. This was largely because the state benefited from massive government spending, including an extensive road building that connected most of the state, increased buying of silver, and various infrastructure projects through the Civilian Conservation Corps and the Works Progress Administration. In fact, between 1933 and 1939, Nevada enjoyed the federal government's highest total expenditures per capita. The largest boost to the economy from the federal government, however, was the building of the Hoover Dam, which provided not just jobs for thousands of workers and pumped millions of dollars into the economy, but also dramatically increased availability of power in the region. Moreover, it transformed Las Vegas. The site had been originally a Mormon fort intended to convert the natives and gather supplies for people going from Salt Lake City to Los Angeles. Built in 1855, it was later abandoned and would not be officially founded as a city until 1905. For its first two decades plus, it did not grow much, however. By the time the building of the Hoover Dam began, it had a mere 5,000 souls calling it home. By the end of it, only four years later, it had nearly doubled to over 8,000 people. Meanwhile, what finally propelled the state completely out of its economic slump was tourism, as it was during this time that its modern economy, based around visitors' dollars began, by allowing gambling and easy divorce. The latter granted residency in the state after six weeks, rather than six months, making it an attractive destination to alter one's marital status. Soon, places like Reno, a town originally settled as part of the mineral boom in the 1850s, and later renamed in honor of Jesse L. Reno, a Union general, 
began catering to those who wanted to come get a divorce by building hotels and dude ranches. Gambling had an even more profound impact. Betting on games of chance had been present as a form of entertainment in Nevada since the prospectors began to show up. But drunk men losing money in card games brought plenty of trouble, so the territorial governor, James Nye, first tried to ban it in 1861. For the next 50 years, there were on and off regulations that limited and then expanded gambling, leading to the development of slot machines in the first casino in Las Vegas in 1905, the Golden Gate Casino. The pendulum swung once again in 1910, banning all forms of gambling, and stood that way for 21 years until Governor Fed Balzer lifted the ban in 1931. Given its proximity to California, Reno became the first gaming center, attracting people as well as capital from the neighboring state. One of those pioneers was Bill Hara, who went from owning a bingo parlor in downtown Reno to the first casino listed on the American Stock Exchange, and later to the creation of Caesars Entertainment. Something similar happened in Las Vegas a few years later. Thomas Hall, for example, the owner of various hotels in California, wanted to target motorists traveling from LA to Vegas, so he built a new resort on Highway 91 outside the city limits in 1941. Named Rancho Vegas, it was the first casino on the Strip. Other visionaries came from seedier backgrounds. The most famous is Bugsy Siegel, a mobster based in California who financed another early casino on the Strip in the 1940s, the Flamingo. Unfortunately for him, he was murdered before he could see his project completed, but he paved the way for the Mafia's involvement in the development of Las Vegas. For roughly the next three decades, different mobsters would be involved in the financing and running of casinos, and some, like Frank Lefty Rosenthal, would be innovators, creating the first sports book run out of a casino. This, of course, brought crime and violence. Nasty characters like Anthony Spilotro, Joe Pesci's character in the 1995 film Casino. But eventually, it also brought the authorities' attention. There were the Kefauver congressional hearings in the 1950s, the Black Book or List of Excluded Persons in the 1960s, and tighter gaming license regulations in the 1970s. By the 1980s, when the Midwest Mafia bosses were convicted of skimming off various casinos, their grip on Las Vegas came to an end. There was another pillar of Nevada's economy that began in the 1940s, defense. Nevada had vast open land, sunny weather, good railroad connections, and because of the Hoover Dam, plenty of cheap power. It was a good place to train in harsh terrain and test nuclear weapons, which the military did over a thousand times in the state between 1951 and 1992. It also had senators that lobbied hard to get military installations in the state. Today, Nevada has two Air Force bases, one Army base, and one Navy base. Politically, the state has never been dominated by any one party for very long. Moments of complete dominance happened for the Republicans in the early 1860s and late 1880s, and for the Democrats in the late 1930s. But most of the time, the legislature and governorship have been held by different parties, or when they are united under a single party, crucial federal offices were held by the opposing party, as was the case in the early 2000s when Republicans controlled state government, but their senator, Harry Reid, was a Democrat that was also a Senate Majority Leader. Today, the pattern is holding with a new Republican governor, Joe Lombardo, in a legislature controlled by the Democrats. Because of this tendency toward skepticism of both parties, Nevada has often played the role of swing state in presidential elections. In fact, since 1988, the only person to win the state by more than 5% is Obama, twice. The winner of the other six elections won by only a handful of points every time. Meanwhile, the state's population exploded between the 1950s, when the interstate highway made it even easier to attract tourism, and the 2000s. The vast amount of cheap land and plentiful jobs that required little to no education in the gaming industry made it one of the last places in the country where middle class status could be achieved with a high school degree or less. Since 2008, however, life has gotten much more difficult. That year's financial crisis saw thousands lose their homes and their jobs, or in the best case scenario, equity in their homes. The legalization of gambling in other states and its migration to online forums made it much more difficult to attract tourists to the state, and while this has led to some diversification, entry-level jobs have become more demanding and less well-paid. COVID was another huge hit, which further pushed the gaming industry to reimagine a world where they could compete virtually. But this has not been easy. In 2022, Nevada had the highest unemployment rate in the country at 5.2%. And so once again, the state seems to be stuck in its boom and bust cycles, 
and facing enormous environmental challenges, particularly regarding access to water. It's too soon to know whether this will lead the state to completely reinvent itself as it has done in the past, but I wouldn't bet against them.